Hi, I'm Donna Ray. And I'm Al Wadley. Welcome to our podcast, Feldenkrais for Life. In each episode, we will discuss ideas and experiences pertaining to the Feldenkrais method. You're going to learn skills that will move pain to comfort, anxiety to ease, and we'll explore learning and how to spark creativity. To learn more about Donna, visit her site at DonnaRay.com. To find Al Wadley, go to AchievingExcellence.com. Hey, Donna. Hi, Al. So good to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. You've been in uh, Austria. I have been. I taught in Austria and Vienna uh, for the last 20 days, most of February, actually. And I had two different groups there. Uh, One group is approaching their awareness through movement uh, practicum and certification, and the other one is moving toward graduation next July. So lots of interesting material and wonderful students, so inquisitive and eager to learn and appreciative. So that's so totally cool that you had that experience in Austria and Vienna. So one of the things you mentioned, we were talking before we started this recording, and you mentioned that some of the students came up to you, or one in particular, and I guess you spoke for other students, and talked about how you helped give them courage, helped give them courage. This is like a really cool and under discussed aspect of our work is how practicing the Feldenkrais method does give us courage. It helps us to build confidence and a stronger sense of self. So I wonder, can you share a little bit about what that was about? So how did that come about in that training? Did you have a courage building strategies or was it just like in a natural emergent property from the experiences that you created? I think it was um, a surprise to me, and I'm wondering as we're speaking if he said courage or brave, but I think they go together in any case. I think when we're feeling courageous, we're also feeling brave. And it was a brief conversation that I'd like to follow up on with him and with others in the group. So I'll get to do that in May because I'm directing these two trainings. So I see these students many times over four years, and that is incredibly satisfying because I really get to know people and watch their development over the course of a four-year training program. So I will inquire, and uh, I'll get back to you on that. But I'm guessing that you're already alluding to what takes place in the Feldenkrais Method when we're really immersed in it, and whether that be in-depth training in a four-year course or weekly ongoing classes coupled with hands-on work, people feel themselves so deeply, and they become more confident. And I think they become courageous and brave because they feel their capability in new and different ways. They feel capable of reaching out and connecting to other people. They feel capable when it comes to learning, learning more material. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. This has been something that's been coming up in my practice in the last few months. I work with a lot of older adults, and a number of them have commented on just their feeling of confidence, a greater sense of confidence, especially through the winter months, where we've got a lot more ice build up, snow build up. This winter's been really hard that way in Colorado, which is unusual for us Coloradoans. Usually you get a snow and it melts off and sidewalks are clear. It's sunny days, but this winter's been cloudy and cold, and the ice has been sticking around. And people have been coming in, they've been talking about how they have a greater sense of confidence. So even in this challenging environment, that they have that greater sense of confidence in their ability, as you mentioned, to be able to get out, to go walk, and do the things they want to do. Which I think this is a really remarkable aspect of the work. Not like we practice confidence, right? Yeah, but I'm thinking about people saying that in that in this stormy weather and walking on snow or ice. And, you know, what's needed is very refined balance, being sure-footed, taking, stepping, and making sure you're on 
ground that's going to support you and not, you know, you're not going to slip and fall down. And so the awareness of balancing well creates confidence and security because that's one of our most fundamental fears, falling down. It is. So if you know you can stand on your own two feet and walk in any direction, you feel much better about being out there and walking around in life, you know. Now, I heard a couple of astonishing recently. It was about statistics, um, and I'm going to horribly misquote these, so don't hold me to the exact facts. Uh, uh, somebody was telling me something like, uh, most falls for women over 65 lead to some kind of chronic degenerative illness after that. Dementia in some cases, um, other kinds of chronic problems can develop from that. And that was really uh, shocking to me. Have you heard statistics like this? You know, I, I haven't heard statistics, but I've known people and I've heard that one of the greatest fears for people over 60, 65 is falling down because it's an implication that many things are going to go wrong and people often don't recover well. So they have a chronic hip problem then or a knee problem or a wrist problem. And I took a big fall myself, as you know, a year and a half ago or so. It took a while to rehabilitate. I'm fully, you know, 100%. But if people don't have something like the Feldenkrais method, they often give up or give in unnecessarily to whatever is ailing them. So it takes tenacity to grow old and be well. I agree. Yeah, totally. It takes tenacity to grow old and be well when you do it. And mm -hmm. that is something that the following press method helps with. So I think the people, you know, in this statistic, you know, it's a, it's a bell curve, right? So in the peak of the bell curve, this is what happens to a lot of people that they can have these kinds of chronic illnesses that develop or chronic issues that develop. Like you said, it could be a sore hip or something else. And that's the middle of the bell curve. On the outliers, on the two sides of the bell curve, I think are where our students lie, certainly where we lie, which is that ability to uh, sense ourselves, to be able to have resilience, reversibility, to be able to come back from a fall, and to be able to fall well. And that's an issue that I get reported from my students often. So they do fall, but they don't hurt themselves. Because there's something intrinsic about practicing this work, doing Feldenkrais lessons, whether you're in a four-year training or you're doing weekly classes or you're getting hands-on lessons, that something happens in the brain and the nervous system to allow for a more responsive, more responsive abilities when there are sudden changes in the environment, like when you slip or fall or something like that. You have that ability to respond and to protect yourself. That's I think, a really beautiful aspect of the work. And that that gives people confidence when they can fall and be okay. That's a very different part of that, that whole curve there. And that's part of resilience, isn't it? Is that knowing that you can recover from something that's challenging, whether it be falling down or bumping into something or having a fender bend or whatever it is, or, you know, losing your favorite house pet. I mean, all of these things they are bumps in the road. And when we have a sense of well-being and resilience, everything is more possible. It's, it's more possible to overcome and to find our stability and face forward, as Dr. Feldenkrais used to say, and move into life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, the other thing that's been on my mind is that in Great Britain recently, they appointed a minister of loneliness. Have you serious? heard of this? No. This is serious business. It's really serious. It sounds silly, but it's not. There are so many lonely people, and it's true in the United States also. We have more loneliness reported than ever before. And part of it is from the pandemic, but not entirely. People were already disconnected, and then the pandemic made it much worse. And folks are having a really hard time joining groups and socializing and being comfortable in their socialization. We know it's not beneficial to people to stay home alone. 
It's not good for people. We're social animals. We need people. So Britain is allocating money to groups to entice people to, to join all different kinds of things, dog walking groups, you name it. And the article that I read in the New York Times said they're, you know, they have the wherewithal to, to not say, if you're lonely, come to these groups. Instead, they're really advertising lots of different kinds of group settings to people so that they will be feel the, you know, the urge to join to make them look appealing and supportive and welcoming. So I hope it works. I hope we get some reports on that to see if it works. So the other part of that is that this training institute in Vienna that I'm the educational director of, they have, you know, tea and coffee and cookies. They have introductory seminars. They have workshops. They have six weekly classes, two training programs. They have all these activities going on under the same beautiful roof. And people are flocking to this institute. And I really, I said, you know, we're already addressing the issue of loneliness here. We really welcome people in the door. They can visit the training and see what we're doing. It's, so we create a lot of warmth and connection. And uh, that just made me feel really good being there and seeing so many people. And people come that have graduated from past training programs to visit new trainings. And so there's a socialization of so many people interested in learning the Feldenkrais method and using it for their own, you know, their personal benefits. So I love seeing students being trained because then I know they can go to their communities and they're going to do the same thing. I think that's really interesting that that England has created this minister, a minister of loneliness. Ministry of loneliness. Ministry of Loneliness. I think it's really interesting, and mm-hmm. I hope it works. It, it is a big issue, and I think that pandemic definitely contributed to that, and social media also paradoxically contributes to that, where in That's a world true. where we're more connected to people than ever before, it's having this weird effect where it is creating more isolation and more loneliness. And I think a lot of self other comparisons that people are making about themselves to the other people they see on the internet and the things that they're doing. And I think that's not useful. That doesn't build confidence and doesn't build security and doesn't improve abilities. Agree. And you've got to get out and do things to feel confident. And you have to be in the room with people to feel to feel socially connected. There's an illusion of connection. I mean, I you know, I feel connected to you. We're looking at each other on Zoom. But being in the same room would be really different. There's something more intimate about it. Yeah, there's so much more, uh, I don't want to say energy, but so much more information exchanged between us and mm-hmm. that on so many different levels, you know, conscious and unconscious when you're in the same room. Um, here is a visual and auditory, you know, but I'm just seeing your head and your shoulders and you mine. So that's a different kind of communication. Yeah. And social connection is so important, so vital. One of the things I was hearing about the other day is even just small social connections can make a big difference. Like you go to the store and you have a two or three minute conversation with a clerk that is pleasant and you both leave feeling uplifted. Even a small thing like that can make a big difference in terms of building social connection and helping you feel a little bit happier and alleviating some of that isolation or sense of loneliness. Yeah, I agree. And we know that you know, there's heart rate resonance. There are all kinds of things going on in between people when they're in the same space together that's calming. And uh, yeah, we need other people. So any listeners, please get out, see people, go for walks with people, You know, meet somebody for coffee or tea and Reach out to someone that you think might be marginalized or not included. We can do a lot for others by including them in gatherings or even a cup of tea. Yeah, so totally. And it doesn't take much. Like I said, it can just be a brief interaction with somebody in a store or a clerk or taking the time to carve out and contact an old friend that you haven't been in touch with or seeing a friend that you like to spend a lot of time with. Just 
uh, just reach out and create some kind of social network because it's really important. Yeah, and if your practitioner's listening, there's more that we can do. Um, having social time before and after a class, even if they're on Zoom, you can have people check in, say hello. They can report the differences after the lesson, sharing their thoughts, feelings, and you know observations, and it creates it creates a more just camaraderie and reduces that feeling of being alone. Yeah, when I have people log into my classes, I always let them log in unmuted. Uh huh. So they're just they if they want to, they can chat and interact a little bit with each other, and then we always close out the lesson with the discussion. So those who want to participate can come up close and unmute themselves and have a discussion about what they experienced. And that's always fun. It's a really nice aspect of socialization to that and sharing of experiences, which is great, especially if you've got some new people in the class that some people can comment about what they're experiencing. And it's always, it's always different too. People don't report the same thing. They did the same lesson. They didn't do it exactly the same way because they are unique individuals. And when they report, about that, they all report a slightly different experience, which really goes to speak to the work about how we each process it uniquely, how we make it our own when we do a lesson. And that really helps us in the way that we each need to be helped, which is unique. Yeah. And so it, um, the perception of change is very individual. And sometimes when we're observing people after a lesson, we can see that there are commonalities of change among our students, but they don't necessarily sense and perceive them the way that we do. And that's one of the reasons we encourage people to report to us rather than, you know, the practitioner telling them what is different. So it becomes a conversation about differences, but we want to hear what the student says before we taint their self-observation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we rarely comment on what I observe with somebody. I really want it to be about them and from them so that they're talking about their experience. And then, you know, I'll comment, add on, you know, help to embellish that and add more clarity. But I'm I'm not going to tell people what they're experiencing. Right. It's good to see you today, Al, and have this discussion about, well, all kinds of things, how to overcome loneliness building confidence, courage, and bravery within the Feldenkrais Method. Totally. Um, totally. Yeah. That was great talking with you again. So I just remind people you can tune, you can learn more about us and our offerings at uh, DonnaRay.com and for me, AchievingExcellence.com. And please read us. You can read us up to five stars on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We can greatly appreciate that. And you can send us comments and questions directly to our Feldenkrais for Life podcast. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Take it easy. Bye. Bye. If you'd like to follow up with a question, send an email to info at Feldenkraisforlife.com. We would love to hear from you. You can learn more about us on our websites. You can find Al at AchievingExcellence.com. You can visit my site to join my classes and reach out to me for private lessons online or at my Longmont studio. You'll find my store, the Feldenkrais store there as well. We can purchase books, audio products, and videos. Donna's website is DonnaRay.com. And if you visit my website, you'll find that I'm offering individual sessions group classes in the Feldenkrais Method, mentoring groups, professional Feldenkrais training program information, and recorded lessons. Thank you again so much for joining us. I look forward to you hearing us next week. Bye now. Bye. <laughs>